Hi, my name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you are listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast. Each week, we discuss our latest data research in a topic related to app development and back-end services. My co-host for the show is Donnie Burkholz of 451 Research. Now let's get to the show. Hi, Alex Williams of the New Stack here for the New Stack Analyst Show with my co-host Donnie Burkholz. Afternoon. And we have some guests today. Let's introduce ourselves. Adrian. Hi, Adrian Cockcroft. James Temple. Great. Well, this, uh, this is one of the better conferences of the year, and I think it's the partly due to the single track and it's the quality of the speakers. Uh, it's hard to, you know, in any, in any event like this, to like say what's better than, than, than uh, what, what session has been better than others, but I'm just curious about what are some of the takeaways you guys are getting towards the end of like this second day uh, about what you're hearing and, how it, and what's resonating with what you're hearing in the rest of the market. Donnie? Yeah, I mean... Obviously, the, the last talk is the one that's on top of mind right now, which was a uh, UX researcher from GitHub. Mm-hmm. That was really outstanding in terms of, you know, things people don't realize we should be thinking about, things you can't really get easily with monitoring, um, but you have to take sort of a qualitative research approach to say, like, to even understand the right questions to ask, to understand the right things to, to track, you have to go out there and talk to people in the first place. Um, and I really appreciate that. Like, one stat that really stood out to me was, uh, they do a survey for new GitHub users, and 71% of them don't know Git when they sign up for GitHub. Which is like, wow, that's something I never would have guessed, right? The assumption is, oh, well, if you're signing up for GitHub, you want to do things with Git, and so you probably know it, but I guess that's not how it works. I figure I can't figure out how to use Git about an hour after I stop reading the documentation. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so I use the, the Macintosh Git client thing and that remembers how to use Git for me and I push buttons and it works. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different levels of how to use Git, right? Like yeah. I can successfully uh, clone and commit and push, but you start doing stuff uh, with you know rebasing and it gets a little bit sketchy and I'm not yeah. quite sure if things are going to work out right. Yeah. I'm not sure whether people remember, but uh, Scott Chacon, who is the CTO at GitHub, actually spent two years on the road with his free pro Git book basically going to conferences doing introduction to Git. I, every time I turned around at a conference, there'd be Scott with introduction to Git. And uh, he wasn't even selling GitHub at all. He was just saying, here is Git, here's how you use it. Um, and by the way, I work for this company that makes it easy for you, and here's how we make it easy for you. And did an amazing sales job. I think their initial success is largely due to some of that sort of push. Yeah, and it's yeah. funny, like, how many people still are getting up to speed with that, right? Like, with the 71% stat. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a, a webcast in a couple of weeks that's like, here's distributed development. Let's talk about this. The models well, are different. Laura Thompson this morning saying that they have five version control systems at Mozilla. Um, you know, and that's what we would consider a reasonably, what we'd assume hopefully a reasonably forward-thinking organization. Mm-hmm. And you take that into the enterprise. I mean, uh, I know a lot of large-scale uh, financial service institutions who run on no version control or C- CBS is modern and exciting. Um, well, they actually have all of them, except they're all in little pockets in yeah. random places and there's yeah. no big view. Yeah. We were just talking about this in a, in a briefing I had uh, with uh, Docker acquiring the latest, uh, the latest update for, you know, for version control issues and how it's posing issues for people. Um, so it's, uh, it's a problem that's never, not going to go away anytime soon. Are there other topics of interest that you saw here, James, that, that, struck, that struck you? Um, I was really excited about the Google talk this morning. Um, I've spent a, a lot of years trying to persuade Google folks to talk about their stack and about um, the, pro- the, the software they build um, uh, and the way they do things. I think not all of the tools are, you know, can't easily just open source something Google built. Um, uh, I think it might not be as hard as they make it out to be, but um, uh, certainly the, the, the lessons learned, and I said this morning to a few people that if Google had given that talk 10 years ago, we probably, Monotorama might be a very different event, and we might be talking about a very different monitoring stack. Why now? Uh, why Go- Google talking about it now? Yeah, or? why do you think? Why now? Well, I mean, so, why, why, so why not a year ago or five years ago? I think at, at the end of that talk, it's, he's, he mentioned, I think, the key reason, which is that the Google Cloud is going to need monitoring, and they're figuring out how to rebuild the internal monitoring to be multi-tenant, to be encrypted, to be you know, encrypted at rest and secure. And you know that means they have to start explaining what this thing is and where it came from to people to try and use it. So I think it's it's Google opening itself up 
as a cloud vendor, public cloud vendor that's really forcing some of their open kimono, kind of this is how it works, this is this thing we built, you can get this service that's related to this paper that everyone else copied or whatever, you know, there's, there's a lot more detail coming out of that. Yeah, I've always thought about Google as a company um, trying to convince everybody else to compete in their paradigm, right? With, uh, you know, like MapReduce white paper, with everything else, and they're finally getting to the point of doing that in the form of, of code and real implementations rather than, than academic white papers, right? Like Kubernetes is another perfect example of that. Yeah. Like, how do we get people thinking about competing the way that Google does so that it's easier for them to start using, let's say, Google Cloud Platform than any other cloud platform, or so that it's easier for them to... Uh, you know, become productive once Google hires them. Is there anything in particular about what they're saying about monitoring that that struck you as different or unique? Uh, a lot of the problems people are encountering right now, or, or the, the problems that people are, are sort of perceiving in a more widespread sort of way, they were thinking about 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think that, that uh, stuff like, you know, metrics are critical. Um, you know, uh, distributed systems and monitoring distributed systems is incredibly hard. Like this sort of, a bunch of people are like, oh, this is a new problem. And it's like, it's not actually a new problem. Um, but, you know, they, they've shed a lot more light on, on how they do it. And, and uh, uh, hopefully, we'll hopefully, you know, some lessons learned there that people can take away and we can see the tool ecosystem sort of grow. Yeah, that's a lot of tools that are really aimed at uh, pets, right? That's yep. the traditional tooling from 20 years ago were aimed at that big database server running Oracle. You know, I used to look after all those vendors when I was at Sun and help tune them up and tell them how to manage Solaris better. So those were for big vertically scaled systems. What we've got now and what they're talking about is systems for managing a, a herd of identical machines. Something that looks more like Mesos or Kubernetes is the new paradigm and you've got thousands or tens of thousands of machines. You know, Netflix's Atlas system is that you know, it scales up to about 100,000 machines. That's, that's the level of billions of metrics because they have to do that. Although I think you heard also from Google and from Netflix that 99 point something percent of the metrics are never looked at. Um, and there are other people quite noticing that most of their metrics are the value zero. Um, and why are you storing the value zero on disk? There's another little optimization that's fairly easy to make. Yeah, yeah. welcome to compression. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree with Adrian. There's very limited circumstances where you care about the value zero. Um, yeah. Whether you have a zero or not sometimes matters. Like if the yeah. if the value zero doesn't appear, you might want to store something else to say, hey, the source has gone away. But, yeah. but you can get quite good compression by not storing any metrics that couldn't zero. Yeah. The thing I was, you know, I was like, well, oh, it would be great if we could throw away 99% of the data because we don't need it. Well, how do you predict which 1% is the 1% you need? That's the challenge. Yeah. That, that was my part of what Roy was talking about in mm -hmm. his in this Netflix discussion was the um, they built a meta tool for measuring how the monitoring tool was being used so they could figure out which metrics were being used and which weren't so they could clean out things that really had no use um, that were just there because some engineer put them there and then that, they probably left or they worked for another project they would think about it yeah. yep. so th there are definitely metrics that aren't looked at often that are important but there's a huge proportion of them that you really don't actually need, but just there for histor historical reasons. Yeah, the other thing I was struck by in Roy's talk was when he said, our biggest cloud spend is metrics. And finally, it, it took uh, uh, one of the guys from Fastly came over to talk to me. He's like, oh, well, that's because they have a CDN, right? Like, streaming movies isn't... No, it's nothing to do with the CDN. Isn't cloud spend, right? No, he totally ignoring the CDN. Um, the biggest spend on Netflix is the monitoring system. Mm -hmm. It's huge amounts of RAM to store all those metrics that they're processing in real time. I agree with that. A significant portion of our AWS spend is Redshift and, uh, and things to store metrics and burn pipeline and Kinesis and things like that because we, you know, we, we very, very tightly uh, instrument the site and how people interact with it and we make serious product decisions based on you know, analyzing how people, you know, can we get someone to check out? Can we get someone to discover the right project? And we know we know on the scale of, of Netflix, so I imagine that multiply that by... 10,000 times. And yeah, you know. the, the problem that Netflix has is the permutation explosion where you're monitoring uh, a metric, but then you want to know the metric by device type, and there's over a thousand SKUs of device type, and so you kind of try and, well, you could do it over a thousand times, the number of, you know, multiply that metric by a thousand of them, and then you want to do, but in which country? Okay, so there's yeah. currently 50 or 60 countries, so the 60,000 variants of that metric and if you want to see if there's a problem on Xboxes in Chile, 
right, for some reason, you know. And then there's all the different ISPs you're routing it through. So that's one of the reasons that Netflix has a lot of metrics, and they are really business metrics. This isn't CPU time on a box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. measuring how many times somebody had an error doing a thing in a place, and if you aggregate that too much, you lose the, the ability to find the anomalies. Yeah, yeah, that's the point I was going to make, too, is the importance of business metrics, right? Like, it's easy to say, oh, well, here's the value of this metric, because we're making product decisions based on it. Yeah. The thing I would have imagined is a lot more challenging is saying, like, oh, well, let's store, um, you know, CPU percent, let's store disk use yeah. at, like, a microsecond level forever. Yeah, I don't really, I mean, so from our point of view, you know, Kickstarter being project, project being successful with someone backing the project, it's effectively a conversion. Um, that's the metric that, that we really care about as a business. Like, the CPU, the memory, like, mm, like maybe we're, if we were diagnosing some low-level problem, but again, the pets and cattle metaphor, I'm more likely to blow the instance away than care about spending eight hours digging through some kernel metric. Yeah. So there were a couple of talks that are a bit more technical. They were trying to compare against last year. I think there were a few more technical talks last year. Um, but uh, Brendan Gregg, again from Netflix, was going on, you know, looking inside the instance and asking for tools that give you more than just SAR or the basic, you know, CPU is busy thing. And there's a lot of very interesting detail um, data sources available in Linux that most people aren't just, you know, they don't understand them because you really have to be a bit more of a kernel engineer to figure it out. So that was on one side. And then um, Baron Schwartz from Vivicortex was talking about some statistical techniques that sounded interesting. Um, and a, a data structure called a sketch, which lets you capture things with sort of high compression looking for events, but you're trying to match a pattern. And then some statistical ideas for finding rare but uh, statistically interesting events and sort of how to algorithmically do that. I think it was, again, probably went over the head of a lot of people in the audience, but it's good to see discussions of basic techniques and, and more it, advanced things. That was, that was in part and parcel with the anomaly discussion covered, isn't it, with Heron a little bit, and you, you know, it, it try to understand the anomaly. So if you see an event, is it anomalous? Well, if you don't see it very often, then it appears very occasionally, then it is anomalous, and they can find very rare events, and they don't throw them away, whereas if you're just sampling events, or you keep all the events, you know, how do you know how many to keep? So what they've got is an algorithm that figures out which events are most interesting that you should keep, right? and that, that was a, in, you know, that's basically what they were trying to do. Yeah, right. So they were upwitting the sampling of rare events and downwitting the sampling yeah. of things that happen all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think that um, uh, that also is an, an interesting way to solve the downsampling challenges. Like, there are, there are things that you really care about, and there are other things that, well, they're pretty consistently, you can roll those up, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, or you can average them out of existence. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, which is why, you know, the, the... And it's strange, like, the I think some of the unicorn stuff that we sort of see in sort of the monitoring space is that like I still have to explain to people why percentiles matter and, and, and measuring things like averages do not actually tell you anything useful about your environment. Yet if I go out to middle America, pretty much every business in the world in front of the graphite has an average CPU thing and I'm like, or an average latency or an average response time for applications. And I'm like, does this tell you anything meaningful about the state of your infrastructure? No, it doesn't. Um, but at the 99th percentile, on the other hand, maybe I'm seeing some actual behaviors where I can identify that some of my users are having a not great experience that I would otherwise not know about at all. Um, and th that sort of stuff, I think, is, a, like, as you said, basic techniques is in limited, yeah. maybe not limited circulation, but not great circulation. Yeah, I, I actually want to do a talk sometime about latency distributions and how to combine them, which means you end up in multicolor simulation and all kinds of interesting things that, again, get yeah. half the audience here in the headlights kind of looks, but other people go, oh, actually, that looks useful. So right. what's the mark difference, then, if they're... You know, people are still learning the basics. What's the marked difference that we're seeing now? You know, among the user base, is there one? Are we starting to see? I mean, you, you know, see how many people put their hands up when they said, "Who uses Grafana?" About half the audience put yeah. their hands yeah, up. Yeah, more than that. It was more so many. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Right. So some tools have just become pervasive, yeah. right? Graphite and Grafana and and things like that. Maybe Sensu and Agio. So, so there's tools that people just use because that's what they know how to use, and they get graphs, and they're happy. But it, it doesn't tell them, it tells them that the things are okay, maybe it's sort of a security blanket kind of thing, you know, it makes you feel good, but it doesn't really give you a lot, a lot of security. Well, a lot of monitoring is sort of rote, like it's like we've always, like Nagios monitoring of like, you know, the service is running, the CPU, the memory, the disk, um, the thresholds are 75, 85, and 90, or whatever. I, uh, I think that, that we've always done it that way, is, a, is, is pretty much how monitoring has been um, 
uh, has been sort of implemented across organisations. And I think people are now realising, okay, there, there's a different way of doing this, um, and hopefully there'll be a suite of tools that enable that somewhat different way of thinking about things. Yeah, a lot of the time, well, there's the, one of the classes of tools that, that I like, the tools that tell you something you didn't know. Yep. Uh, you know, I work with Baron on Vivid Cortex um, because he's one of our portfolio companies, spend time with him. And that, that's one of those tools where it's looking at, to, looking at your databases in a different way, it's looking at the network traffic, and you can see things that you can't normally see. I and mean, it's got these algorithms for finding anomalies. Yep. And I, I kind of like that, that as a class of tool. Right? You put it on, it tells you, I didn't know this was broken. Or as your regular tools are just giving averages, and something isn't right, but you can't yep. really tell. So, so tools where you put it on and it doesn't tell you when something is broken are the, the, are the uh, ones that are kind of boring. Baron actually published a really interesting blog post uh, last week uh, where he's using um, Mitchell Hashimoto's console um, distributed, uh, I guess, distributed service, well, it's a service discovery tool um, uh, to do monitoring. And he, ha he had a really mixed response. There's a lot of people who are like, God, you don't do it like that. That's totally the wrong tool to do that. We've and, and a lot of it seemed to stem from that. We've always done it this way. And I'm like, no, no, no. He's actually got the right idea. You, you're taking a distributed system that's highly available and using it to monitor something that's also highly available. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not necessarily be fit for purpose, but it's a step in the right direction instead of having a standalone single thing that goes monitoring went away. Oh, it's, monitoring does not equal the availability of production system. Monitoring is useless. So right. well, not even that, but it has to be more available, yeah. right? Yeah. Like your monitoring system has to be probably hundred x more available than whatever you're monitoring. Otherwise, you're losing a lot of data. That yeah. was, well, that was one of my rules from last year. I, I did the opening keynote last year, and I listed things that I thought people should strive for. And one of them was that the monitoring system has to be more available yeah. than the system it's monitoring. And that's not just because you depend on it; it's because what you really want to be implementing is closed loop feedback control, like auto scaling. And if you have a, a failure in your in your in the feedback loop, you will just take yourself out. I mean, you, you can auto scale down to zero up to some maximum, or just break your system completely on autopilot if you have a failure in that loop and you don't have a, a, a well designed control system to to be resilient. So the conference started with a discussion about microservices. Uh, you know, this microservices discussion is something Adrian you know well has been discussed quite a bit. What are some of the takeaways that you guys are getting from this discussion you're here, you know, you're listening to here about monitoring and the discussions we're seeing continuously emerge about microservices? Well, I like that because they, um, Camille put up one of my slides from last year, which was the, the Death Star diagram of every microservice is talking to every other microservice. You draw it in a circle with every lines between everything, just a big circle of blob, and you can't really read it anymore. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to simulate and generate interesting microservice architectures, partly so that because if you just have Grafana or whatever Graphite, you have a lot of graphs, but the graphs aren't linked together. There's no dependency tree. It doesn't say this service goes to this service goes to this service. When you do microservices, you've got a call chain that starts at the edge of some kind of load balancer or a customer hits an API, and then it flows through and maybe talks to 50 or 100 different boxes you know, services as, as it responds to that one request. And if you just have a hundred graphs that are that don't understand that flow, then that's kind of a problem. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in tools that show you the flow and the, and the dependencies. How about graph databases then? Not so much graph databases, just tools that have some way of, of yeah. at least collecting what is the dependency tree and then visualizing the dependency tree. And there are a few tools that tried to do that. Uh, the New Relic just came out with a, a version of that. Uh, I think Datadog are just trying to get that together as well. At Dynamics is sort of, the APM tools have typically always done that. Um, and uh, I think there's a, a gap right now for a good open source visualization that will show you the, the dependency tree. And it comes back to the Google's Dapper paper, which has been implemented as Zipkin and a few other Sort of related. Libraries. So, um, I, you know, obviously, I, I used to work at Puppet Labs, and Puppet is a graph-driven tool. I mean, it's really about. Um, and one of the things Puppet never did very well is expose the graph, uh, and which is essentially you know a dependency tree of all of the things that you manage and configure on your system. Uh, it would not surprise me if either Puppet or Chef or Ansible comes out with something that that um, that provides that at a, a further up the stack and actually allows you to actually introspect that graph and do things with it, and you know, at a more application service level rather than a resource level on a host and. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that would be a killer open source product, and I've said potentially a, a, a killer product you can build on top of. Yeah, I'm playing around. D3 is kind of the uh, gra the JavaScript library that can draw graphs, the D3 force directed graph, and it's a bit clunky, and it, it works for some simple 
performance, but uh, I think that much more in that space, I think, is one of the missing links right now. Yeah, and I think there was a, some attempts to build, um, Cisco attempted to build a network visualization tool in the early 2000s or late 90s maybe that uh, you know, was designed to be able to show you the flows through your network and what would happen if you simulated change or things failed. And it wasn't hugely successful, but I think we probably have advanced far enough that, that some of that stuff is potentially a lot more feasible. Yeah. One other thing that stood out um, on the microservices topic, but going back to so what's sort of changed over the years, I think, in Monogramma is... I think it was PublicConf 2012 when Jamie Wilkinson from Google gave a talk where he got up on stage and did live demos of monitoring data in R and everybody was blown away by it. They're like, wait, you could, what? You just did that? He's like, yeah, sorry, we can't show you what our systems look like, which apparently they can now. Um, But here's the kinds of things we could do with them. And it was crazy, right? And at the time I was like, oh, well, so... I guess now every every system has to become like a data scientist and a you know learn R. And I think one of the things that's changed is we're starting to get to the point now where instead of people doing that, people are saying, um, "Here's a product I built that does that, and let me explain the inside of it to you in case you want to understand." It, like like Baron was. Yeah, I, I I spent a lot of time in R over the years, um, and uh, it's an awesome tool, um, but it's not easy to learn. Um, and I thankfully have a really awesome data science team who every now and again I bump my head against something, and they're far more subject matter experts than I am, but. Uh, it's it, you know, providing the basic the basic set of patterns. It's like these are the things that I could learn from this data, um, and uh, you know, here's some things that that you know, I, I, if I apply these four or five patterns, I'm probably going to get some meaningful information about my environment out of. And yeah, the heart, and providing that level of abstraction is going to be interesting. Wasn't that the the discussion uh, by the guy from Twitter who was talking about the Heron project? It's written in R, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah all, the, all their anomaly detection libraries are R. Uh-huh. I mean, it's great that they're open sourcing them. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been using R and maybe predecessor S plus for twenty something years. So, on and off. If the trouble with it is that there's too many ways to do things. It's a bit like JavaScript frameworks that you don't. You know, everyone tells you to use a different one, and they keep changing, and it's and they all sort of just about work, except for that one thing where you want to, really should be using a different one. So it's it's kind of hard to get everything together, and I think sharing things in R is good, and having pointers to use cases in the systems monitoring space for it, I think is a, you know, this is a bundle of our scripts that work together in this way to solve this problem, and they're relatively yeah. easy to use as from the outside once you bundled it together. The actual language itself isn't hard, it's, it's finding how to do a thing you don't know how to do yeah. that I find really difficult. Yeah, yeah exactly, and, and the use cases are so critical too, like um, in, in, in the talk earlier today, where they were talking about, well, here's the distribution that this type of event data looks like. And if you're using the wrong R library yeah. to analyze that distribution, you're getting results that are totally meaningless, and you have to be an expert in stats to know that. Yeah, we, we actually embed R inside uh, as a Rails engine inside our platform to do our daily monitoring. So it's a bunch of uh, R markdown that, that, that spits out a daily report that gets emailed that says, these are all the statistical things that happen on the site, the money we collected, the popular projects. Um, and uh, that's been, you know, because the data goes straight in, dump, gets dumped straight in. You know, we, we spend a while tuning the things, and it actually works reasonably well. Um, and we rely really heavily on um, uh, tools like Looker, you know, which basically provides you with a sort of interface over the top of Redshift, and you know, we can provide a, a, mm-hmm. an abstraction to to our, our end users. A lot of our community and trust and safety mm-hmm. team do their own queries, do their own re- reports, build their own stuff, because it's relatively easy to teach people, like, this thing plus mm-hmm. this thing equals this result. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, you know, um, high-end statistical problems, they still come to the data team, but for things like, I want to do a sampling of uh, device IDs to identify a particular fraud problem or a network of users who are potentially trying to fraud something, it's relatively easy to teach someone how to build an SQL query to do that if they have a tool that isn't threatening and isn't like a command line SQL statement. Yeah. What are what are the differences in that kind of method that you know Twitter's using with R? And, and I was talking to some people last night, and it doesn't really scale very well. As can and how that compares, for instance, to the way that Netflix would do it by you know looking at outliers as an example. You know, to to to, to like do the same kind of work and help them determine to define what those anomalies are and what impact that they're having. We got filter what's going on to find some. You know, there's a filter of events, right? I mean, the, the Riemann talk from, from Carl Kingsbury was talked about, you gather all these events and then you filter them down and then you measure rates and you, and you look, for, look for patterns in them. So usually the actual algorithms don't have to scale very much. If you're, if you're doing your event filtering right, 
then then you can see things. So you've got to be able to gather raw data on a very broad collection of systems, and then you've got to sort of bring it together and look for things. Like if somebody's uh, dosing your site, then they're coming at, at it across all of your front end. So the actual rate that they come in on any one machine may be below a threshold, but when you aggregate across all of them, it comes into a higher level. Mm -hmm. So people scraping APIs with robots, for example, is the kind of thing that they try and do it slowly enough you don't notice. But if you're aggregating centrally, you can see that. Mm -hmm. So there are some sort of tools for doing that kind of aggregation that are, are an important part of it. Yeah, a couple of the IT folks um, uh, formed a company called Signal Sciences that's doing this sort of web application, sort of basically looking at um, let's aggregate all of the results from, say, all of your Nginx servers and actually detect, attempt to detect a pattern of events from a bad actor uh, across all of these machines that you might not otherwise detect, might be buried in a log somewhere. or And um, I think there's a lot more of that stuff. And they, they certainly, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Etsy open sourcing the kale stuff. You know, the, there's certainly a bunch of scope for to probably build product around that and tools around that. Well, great. Well, uh, the sessions are just starting, so we should probably get down and listen to uh, what's being discussed this afternoon, but uh, thank you guys for being here. Donnie, uh, Adrian, James, thank you very much. This has uh, been the Newstack Analyst Show from Monitorama and the Newstack's hometown of Portland, Oregon. So thanks for being here, guys. Thanks. Thank you. That's it for this week's show. Thank you very much for joining us. Audio editing and sound design for the New Stack Analyst podcast is provided by Broken Hours. You can find them at brokenhours.com. Thanks again, and hope to see you again for the New Stack Analyst podcast. Bye bye.